So if we're thinking about designing for interstellar travel, we've actually already done it. In 2012, Voyager 1 entered interstellar space, and six years later, in 2018, Voyager 2 joined it as the second human-built object to reach interstellar space. And Voyager 1 reported that interstellar space has 70% more galactic cosmic radiation than the space within our solar system. So if people are ever going to venture into interstellar space, we can't really approach this in the same way we've been going to low Earth orbit. So right now, we contend with radiation generally from these sources, but in interstellar space, we're really only going to be concerned about these galactic cosmic rays. And most of us are probably familiar with a schematic like this. We're familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum and the fact that the radio waves over here are harmless and the X and rays and gamma rays over here have a higher energy and are a form of ionizing radiation. And so forgive me if this is all review for you, but because it's a broad audience, I wanted to go through it. Um, so there are more types of ionizing radiation than just the electromagnetic radiation. There are particle beams, which are essentially parts of an atom moving at relativistic speeds. And these differ from electromagnetic waves because they are masses as opposed to energy. And in addition, they cause ionization in different ways. So ionizing radiation is essentially radiation that kicks an electron out of its orbital, thus causing an ion. It ionizes that atom. So particles cause this ionization event directly and can therefore cause a series of events along its path, as well as secondary events if the electrons that it knocks free cause additional ionization events. Whereas electromagnetic waves do not carry charge, and so they cause this ionization event indirectly by transferring its energy to a material that it's traversing. So within the solar system, we've become pretty adept at shielding against the sun's more dangerous radiation, which occurs during solar particle events like uh, solar flares or coronal mass ejections, when proteins uh, emitted by the sun have become accelerated. So although there's a high flux of these particles, they have a relatively low energy, therefore shielding is an effective countermeasure. Now, galactic cosmic radiation, on the other hand, it cannot be stopped. So galactic cosmic radiation is composed of atomic nuclei, and I'm, I'm specifically talking about the higher energy ones. So atomic nuclei that have been accelerated to relativistic speeds, they are originating from outside our solar system. It's hypothesized that it's due to supernova or supermassive black holes, um, no reasonable thickness of shielding material can safely stop galactic cosmic radiation. Even if it weren't an issue due to mass or cost, shielding is only partially effective to reduce the doses experienced inside of a spacecraft because increasing a shield's thickness leads to the production of high levels of secondary radiation, which can be absorbed even more easily by biological tissues. Every particle of galactic cosmic radiation can cause damage to cellular DNA, which is difficult to repair. So ionizing radiation is particularly harmful to living beings in part because of the cellular damage it causes. So in high enough doses, it can disrupt every single cellular function simultaneously and cause immediate death. But what we're more likely to see in interstellar space um, would be doses that cause damage to DNA, not immediate death. So galactic cosmic radiation could directly cause damage to the DNA itself, or it could irradiate the water in your tissues, causing that water to become a reactive oxygen species or a free radical. And these species are highly reactive and their reactivity can cause DNA damage. And this damage could appear as a single stranded break, a double stranded break, which is the most difficult to repair, or it could actually change the molecule and cause a chemical change in the DNA. 
And cells can usually repair these single-stranded breaks. Double-stranded breaks are very, very difficult for the cells to repair. And they can be extremely harmful to cells because they can interfere with DNA replication and protein synthesis. They can also lead to chromosomal rearrangements. And this occurs when one piece of a chromosome of one chromosome becomes attached to another chromosome. And rearrangements like these are associated with some cancers. And sometimes the cell can repair the damage. If not, it does what's called apoptosis. It will apoptose, which is committing suicide. If there's a chemical change, the cell may also apoptose, or it's going to pass that mutation onto its daughter cells, which could also result in cancer. And ionizing radiation causes this damage because disrupting electrons interferes with the covalent bonds within the DNA sugar phosphate backbone. And so, you know, remember, DNA is this complex molecule that's comprised of base pairs of smaller molecules. And the base pairs here, they're connected by hydrogen bonds. And these two can be um, damaged by ionizing radiation. But fortunately, these uh, hydrogen bonds are easier to repair. So high doses of radiation can cause leukemia, radiation, dermatitis, sterility, cataracts, and lung and stomach and thyroid cancer, among others. Astronauts are exposed to ionizing radiation with effective doses in the range from about 50 to 2000 millisieverts. And so one millisievert of ionizing radiation is equivalent to about three chest X-rays. So an astronaut's dose is like if you were to have 150 to 6,000 chest X-rays. Now an eight day space shuttle mission was about 5.5 millisieverts. The nine day Apollo 14 mission was uh, 178 millisieverts. Uh, a six month ISS mission is 160 millisieverts and a projected three year Mars mission. Oh, oh here, the, the Skylab, I forgot to mention that was, um, Skylab was 178, whereas um, ISS is, is 160. But the Mars mission, is projected to be about 1200 millisieverts. And we don't know what the dose of galactic cosmic radiation would look like on an interstellar mission. And we're only beginning to understand the effects of galactic cosmic radiation on biological systems. So what do we know? Well, we know that the further we get from Earth, the more radiation we're exposed to. And so, that's in part because on Earth, we're so protected from radiation. The last line of defense is our atmosphere. And most galactic cosmic particles that make it here, they collide with molecules in the atmosphere starting at the thermosphere. Then there is the protection from our magnetosphere. So this is depicting the solar wind, which blowing outwards from mil billions of kilometers from the sun is the stream of electrically charged gas, which is called the solar wind. And the rotation of the Earth's molten iron core produces this strong magnetic field that protects us from the solar wind and can also redirect or trap many lower energy cosmic particles. Um, the solar wind forms this bow shock in front of the Earth's magnetosphere and it decelerates and deflects this solar wind flow before it reaches the magnetopause here, right? And the sun also protects us from galactic cosmic radiation. So the sun also generates a magnetic field. So the solar wind here radiates outwards at up to 1.5 million miles per hour until it begins to be affected by the interstellar wind as the solar system travels through space. So like the Earth's magnetosphere, the interstellar wind forms this bow shock ahead of the sun's magnetic field. And the heliosphere is this large bubble that's created by the solar solar wind and it's deflected by the interstellar wind and the heliopause is this boundary between the solar wind and the interstellar wind where the pressure of the two winds are in balance and both of the voyager satellites are now entirely outside of the heliosphere and in interstellar space just behind this bow shock 
And in the outer layers of the heliosphere, labeled here, labeled here the slowdown region and the stagnation region, the magnetic field lines generated by the sun have begun to pile up and are intensifying. And these green dots that are indicated here are low energy charge particles that are accelerated in the heliosphere's turbulent outer layer. And when Voyager left the heliosphere, the change in the particles it detected was abrupt. So within a couple of days of leaving the solar system, so this is in within the heliosphere, this is within interstellar space, uh, the quantity of the low energy particles that Voyager detected dropped to a fraction of what they were, while the quantity of the medium and high energy particles, uh, they more than doubled what they had been just a few days prior or triple what it had been a few months prior. And so researchers concluded that the heliosphere protects us from about 70% of galactic cosmic radiation. But where do these particles come from? And so we know that they can only travel 100 megaparsecs, which is 321 million light years. Um, and to give some scale to that, this is where we are in our solar system where we are within our galaxy, where we are within the local group, within the local supercluster, and finally within the universe. And so we know that the furthest galactic rays, galactic cosmic rays that can reach us can come from no further than this box, which is still pretty, pretty far. But most cosmic rays that enter the Earth's atmosphere never actually hit the ground. Most will collide with the nuclei of an air molecule and they'll create new particles that then collide with other air molecules, which in turn create new particles. And in this way, they lose energy and eventually the lower energy galactic cosmic rays will not be able to create new particles. And although most galactic cosmic rays never actually hit the ground because the Earth is bombarded by so many of them, an area the size of your hand is still hit by about one secondary particle per second. And these secondary cosmic rays, they um, constitute about a third of the Earth's natural radioactivity. Now, galactic cosmic ray nuclei span this wide range of energy and therefore the ability to transfer that energy. And the major components of galactic radiation are hydrogen, and helium nuclei, while the remaining 1% to 2% of these particles have atomic charges ranging from Z equals 3, which is um, Z is the atomic charge, which is lithium, to a Z equals 28, which is nickel. And the, they, these are called HZE, high Z and high energy particles, um, such as iron. Iron has a Z uh, or a charge of 26. And uh, they are particularly challenging because they cause the most damage. Now, because they are charged particles, they are affected by magnetic fields and many are deflected by the heliosphere and the magnetosphere. And it was believed that interactions between other particles on the way to Earth, as well as our heliosphere, as well as our magnetosphere, and as well as our atmosphere, would prevent ultra high um, energy cosmic rays from reaching the Earth. But in 1962, one was detected on the order of 10 to the 20 electron volts and it was nicknamed the oh my god particle and for reference the highest energy that our accelerators can give is 10 to the 14th electron volts and when we're doing biological experiments this is 10 to the 8th electron volts on on average right so when various atomic nuclei were accelerated through these photographic nuclear emulsions, researchers were able to capture the radiation events from the primary particle, as well as the secondary radiation events that this primary particle produced. And if you envision these high energy particles as little bullets, the damage that they can reduce becomes somewhat intuitive. At the same speeds, the heavier elements have greater energy and thus greater potential for damage. Damage. And when researchers irradiated human cells with radiation, similar to what we see on Earth, like gamma rays or X-rays, 
Um, and they also uh, ra irradiated them with simulated cosmic rays. So here this is iron. So I'm going to say it's moderately high energy because it's 10 to the 5th as opposed to 10 to the 20th. Then they stain them with the fluorescent marker that will only label double-stranded DNA breaks. And so the gamma rays showed this diffuse damage, while the iron nuclei produced dense ionization along the particle track. And as it traversed the cells. And remember, these are only, this is the nuclei of the cell. These are only double-stranded breaks. And because it only shows the double-stranded breaks, we're not seeing the secondary damage. Because with the galactic cosmic radiation, that secondary radiation can cause damage. Um, so one particle traversal could interact with a cylinder of about one centimeter. So you're not just damaging the cells in the DNA along this track, you're damaging cells along this one centimeter cylinder. So this entire cell and a bunch of its buddies is destroyed. And this is only iron at 10 to the fifth electron volts, nothing like the oh my God particle. And so galactic cosmic ray particle energy allows them to penetrate very deeply into biological tissues, as well as other organic and inorganic materials. In particular, the high Z and energy nuclei are a threat to cells. It can strongly contribute to the cumulative equivalent dose that is absorbed by astronauts below low Earth orbit. And um, it's thought that these nuclei can also strongly contribute to a crew members carcinogenic risk. For example, even at very low energy, iron ions are strong inducers of ovarian tumor formation in rodents. And unlike most solar radiation, they can penetrate deeper into tissues. And due to their high penetration power, galactic cosmic radiation can efficiently reach central nervous system cells and pose a major risk to central nervous system function. And so another group further found that cosmic ray radiation may harm astronauts' brains more than previously thought. And so a group led by Professor Charles Lamoli at UC Irvine exposed mice to charged particles mimicking galactic cosmic radiation and then measured both behavioral performance and physical damage. And the physical damage was revealed by brain imaging and this simulated cosmic radiation. And they went for helium ions, ions because they're more... Um, more abundant than the iron ions, um, it damaged this region of the mouse brain caused the medial prefrontal cortex, which is associated with memory. And in this area, neuron protrusions called dendritic spines decreased in size and number. So dendrites receive chemical signals from other neurons. And after exposure to 30 centigrades of simulated galactic cosmic radiation, the mice showed a 20 to 40% reduction in the number of dendritic spines. Right. And so these are the dendritic spines, these little yellow offshoots. And they're these small branches off the main dendrite and they enable learning and memory. And before radiation, it was very complex. And after radiation, you can see a loss in both the main dendrites and the um, dendritic spines. Now. In their initial studies, they examined only male mice. When they compared male mice to female mice, they found that female mice show a marked resistance to similar doses, and they did not exhibit the same level of behavioral deficits as observed in male mice following exposure to the radiation. They found that male mice exposed to the simulated galactic cosmic radiation showed significantly higher levels of neuroinflammation and more extensive cognitive deficits than females. And so these are a graph of their numbers. So these are the de total den number of dendritic spine and the total spine volume. And the females maintained more than the males. And so 12 weeks following this exposure, irradiated male mice um, showed really significant deficits in object and place recognition memory. Um, they had increased inflammation markers when they analyzed their brains. They found that only male mice showed a significant um, decline of dendritic spine density following the irradiation. So what do we do about this? Well, one group suggested two approaches, one in which we specifically examine the damage done to DNA, or we examine the damage done to the tissue as a whole. And they suggest that there's this linear response to DNA damage versus galactic cosmic 
radiation dose and that uh, any areas of research should focus on the type of radiation present and the sensitivity of the human body to that radiation. And they uh, concluded that since shielding is ineffective, the only effective countermeasure would be to limit the time and space. Uh, their other approach, where they investigate the overall tissue response as a whole, uh, they reaffirm that shielding is ineffective in tissue and that distinct targets for biological countermeasures should be pursued because you get different kinds of um, factors and biological signals in response to this damage, and you can target those factors and biological signals. And so, in other words, we're going to need better drugs and uh, we're probably going to need to send more women. And with that, I would like to take any questions.